Welcome to the STEM Alliance and Microsoft webinar, Impactful Game-Based Learning Experiences. This webinar is co-organized by the STEM Alliance, Scientix, and Microsoft, and it is a part of the Back to School Campaign 2022. My name is Ivana Kovac, and I'm coordinating European Schools Net uh, STEM Alliance. Every year, STEM Alliance organizes the Back to School Campaign in the fall to inspire young people about STEM subjects and careers and to in, uh, ensure innovative workforce in Europe. And together with us in the room today, uh, we have my colleagues, uh, Rocio Benito and Chanel Martinez, who will be supporting this webinar from a technical point of view. So in case you have any issues with your audio or your connection, do not hesitate to send them an email, to send them a message in the chat box. And uh, before going through our agenda to, uh, for today, I would like to share some uh, technical details. Uh, you will see that all your microphones and cameras have been disabled. So in case you have a question for a speaker, you can just post it in the chat. We'll be sharing useful information and links throughout the webinar in the chat, so keep an eye on it. We will also be sharing uh, our first question soon, and it will be not actually a question, but a link uh, for the uh, signature list. And whenever you ask a question, we will make sure to address that to our speaker at the very end of this session. Uh, we will also give our fl the floor to our speaker who will give you the background information on Minecraft and also game uh, game based learning. He will tell you about specific areas of learning and he will provide you interesting examples related to different issues, climate issues, coding and Internet safety and community. And finally, you will be always uh, able to ask him questions throughout the webinar in the uh, chat box and we will address them later in the Q&A sessions. So our speaker for today is Justin Edwards. And before we uh, give the floor to Justin, I would just like to remind you to uh, sign the signature list. We will also add a link in the chat box and this is the only way actually for us to prove this event took place and we can as well continue organizing events like this. And again, if you're interested in the certificate, this is the way to request one. And I'm happy to present uh, Justin, our speaker for today. Justin is Director of Learning Experiences at Microsoft. He leads curriculum, education policy, assessment, and community for the education edition of Minecraft, which I'm sure you're familiar with. He develops immersive games, game based learning experiences that promote deep and rewarding learning that supports curriculum in K-12, technical and also higher education. Justin is Justin's educational projects have been used in over 100 countries and they include also partnerships with global organizations like the Nobel Peace Center and UNESCO. Justin, thank you so much for being here with us today and uh, for being uh, willing to help tell us more about Minecraft. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much and uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're joining. I think most people are joining it's in the evening. Um, so it's great that you could join me this, this, this late in the evening. Um, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to talk to you about Minecraft in an education setting and to explore with you uh, what's possible with game based learning, uh, what's possible with uh, Minecraft in particular and, and where uh, it's all going and how we can use this uh, in our classrooms really to put fun back into education, to bring education to life, to light those sparks that all of us uh, reach out and, and try and do. Before I start, um, I just got a question. You should be able to use your reactions button in the top right hand part of your your screen. Um, so if you can, put your hand up if you have used Minecraft or you've played Minecraft before, or maybe you used it in, in uh, the classroom. So just put the hand up in the reaction. There we go. There's a, a few people, a couple of thumbs going up as well. So there's a few people who have used it before. Uh, maybe not everybody, which is great. So I'm talking to an audience which is largely fresh coming to this as well. So I think you're really going to appreciate and, and enjoy this. So thank you for putting your hand up. If you want to take it down there, you can you can do so uh, as well. That's great. So 
So I'm going to start with uh, what is uh, Minecraft Education Edition? How do we use Minecraft in the classroom? And I'm going to play you a little short video um, which will give you a sense of the work that I do. Hopefully that gives you a sense of uh, what it is we we do at Minecraft Education Edition. I actually joined about a year and a half ago and uh, my previous role, I was head of uh, A-levels and GCSEs in, in Northern Ireland, part of the UK. I was one of the, the UK's uh, examinations leads, uh, if you like, running examinations uh, for high school and university entry matriculation. And I came across uh, Minecraft. I've always been a game player and I always have enjoyed games, but I came across Minecraft um, in, a, in a particular way, which was looking at project based learning. How do we actually take projects into the classroom that stimulate uh, thoughts on cross curricularity? So bringing together mathematics skills with engineering skills, with STEM skills overall. How do we bring those all together and inspire young people to coordinate all those skills, coordinate with one another and build uh, worlds together and share that in a learning experience with their teachers? Um, and I was I was deeply inspired by that at the time. I, I saw a new model of learning starting to emerge and a new engagement starting to emerge, particularly with uh, younger children in these particular projects I was seeing. And somebody had approached me and said, um, we'd like to build a project on this to prove it further. And and I said, yes, you know, in, in my role from exams and curriculum head, I, I decided, yeah, I'll, I'll fund a, a particular project. So the project that, that got funded at that time was looking at the Vikings and the heritage of the Vikings. And this, this group of uh, elementary schools were doing a project on building Viking worlds and understanding how the Vikings lived and how they adventured all over the world, uh, creating maps and creating innovations and, and building that together. But at the same time, they were exploring not just history, but science and technology through that, and they built it out in Minecraft. And I thought I'd share that video from that uh, early project with you, because the children talk about their experience. And at the end of the day, all these projects and all this work we do is about young people and how they're engaging with education. So to take you from that first video of what it is we do to actually the impact of it, I thought I'd play this for you.
and it thanks for the round of applause i mean every time i watch that video it still it still gets me and and michael um who is on that video is a most wonderful principal most wonderful school principal who had this vision about how he would bring it into his classroom and how he'd inspire his learners for 21st century skills he recognized it wasn't just about uh, individual skills on their own. It's how you connect the skills together and how you connected that history with the mathematics, with the communication. And he phoned me up and said, you need to come down here. You need to come and see the faces on these children. And this idea that joy, you know, we've all seen it, the, the joy in, in the eyes of a child when they're getting it and they're really connected to that learning came alive in, in that classroom, that classroom that he was leading. And, and thankfully he let us then come down and film uh, that and have a have a conversation with him after and it really inspired me to look deeper into Minecraft and and thankfully I, I got the opportunity then to join the the Minecraft team uh, and take up the role of leading what was happening on curriculum um, and also the content within inside the the Minecraft education portfolio and I'm going to talk I'm going to spend the rest of the time today talking about that curriculum and content and areas of learning and how we bring that to life and also the areas that we haven't focused on um, and why we haven't focused on those and where other people are focusing on those as well and using this platform and, and extended it out. To give you a sense of the reach of Minecraft before I get into the curriculum, the average player of Minecraft today is 24 years old. It's not a product that is just being used by young people and children like we saw in that video. It's seeing generations, people who are parents now, who grew up with Minecraft coming through. So the acceptance of game-based learning with inside the classroom has really expanded. It's also multinational, uh, 116 countries for the Minecraft Education Edition alone. So it crosses boundaries and barriers. You're not just connecting or you have the opportunity to connect children in your own school. You have the opportunity to connect children in different countries and regions. And that opens up the prospect of having conversations and building understanding between countries and between areas of the world. So that's a powerful aspect as well. And as you heard from the previous video, it provides opportunity for 21st century skills, the ability to communicate and work together to build and create things, to visualize, to build that design thinking into everything that's happening around the game is exactly the skills that employers like myself are looking for for the people that we employ. So this game is really stretching out into the areas where education needs it most, with generations now starting to hook back into it. And that's been supported by numerous research. We've seen research, particularly over the last decade, grow on game-based learning and is starting to prove that it's highly effective. It's highly effective for all children in the classroom on a range of abilities in tackling difficult and challenging topics and actually immersing deeply learners into content of learning and developing their learning skills. And when I joined then Minecraft, I started thinking about the areas of the curriculum that we could address. We can address pretty much anything with this product. We have addressed maths, we have addressed uh, language skills, we've addressed art. But I've only got a finite resource, so where could we bring the power of this platform and the millions of children who use the platform every day to most impact? Where could we have the most impact in terms of the learning that we could provide with the education edition? And there were three main areas that I wanted to focus on, but also an opportunity to build uh, uh, a community of creators and educationalists in the fourth area so they could feel confident tackling the other areas of the curriculum that we weren't able to address directly ourselves. The first area was computer science. At the end of the day, Minecraft is, is owned by Microsoft and Microsoft is a computer science company. It's a computing company. It has produced software for many decades. And so computer science is very much at the heart. And computer science is, as I'm sure you all know on this call, so central to tomorrow's employment opportunities and today's opportunities as well. Lifting people up from disadvantage into opportunities in employment is going to rely on their ability to tackle computer science agendas. And as a 
previous public sector curriculum director for state advising ministers, I always used to flag computer science is an area where we really do need to focus and build up skills and capabilities from an early age and develop those through. And we wanted to focus on computer science in its broadest term. So we wanted to focus on coding um, and being able to build block coding right the way through to text scripted language like Python. We wanted to introduce young people through the game to cloud, to data engineering, to all the concepts of what's happening with the disbursement of information around the world, and also take an opportunity to introduce young people to artificial intelligence the early concepts of AI and developing that knowledge so that they have the power to understand what's happening in the world around them, particularly as AI develops. The second area was community. So as I said before, Minecraft has played 116 countries for the education edition alone, more if you look at the consumer edition. But how do we connect the people in those different countries together? In a world that's going through dramatic change and difficulties and challenges like the pandemic, how do we allow young people to focus on who they are, who they are with inside their community, and how they connect communities together and develop empathy and understanding? So we needed to develop content that focused on place and my identity with inside a place to understand how they can give back to communities and then how to, they can actually create long lasting connections with inside that community as well. The third area was climate and sustainability. One of the great challenges our globe faces at the moment, well documented and I'm sure we're all fully conscious of the effects. Many countries around the world have it as part of their curricula now, taught at different stages of learning. What I wanted to do was bring the opportunities of not just understanding climate impact, but actually the changes that we could make. And as was mentioned before, I got opportunity early on, and I'll talk about this later, to work with UNESCO on this and actually help young people understand the sustainable development goals and what they mean and how they can participate in that. But actually to go further and start to understand the effect on the world around us, the effect on our lives, but also the changes that we can make to undo that. And then the fourth area, as I said before, is empowering the creator community to be able to build the content in all the other spaces. So all the other material that teachers and educators need to lift young people up and use this platform in order to do that, be that in the classroom or be that at home or be that in another place of learning, maybe in after school. So I'm going to talk about each of these areas. I'm going to start with the, the, the climate area. Um, and recently, just uh, last week, actually, we launched a collaboration uh, with BBC Earth uh, to deliver uh, Frozen Planet 2. And this was a long cycle of um, a long cycle of development of content, a culmination of an awful lot of work that we did to link together uh, how we do climate impact and climate action. And I had been working with the Met Office, which is a UK um, meteorological office, which does a lot of weather forecasting around projects. And I was explaining uh, to a community of people in the UK how we were building worlds that explain climate change using the science from the Met Office. And on that call was somebody actually from BBC Earth. And they, they approached me afterwards and said, look, we're really interested in how we do a collaboration. We've got this great project. It's taken four years to film. Uh, this work, uh, where we film the animals of our frozen world, not just the poles, but actually all places in the world where there's ice and snow and where it freezes, to tell both the story of these amazing animals, but also the impact that climate is having on their lives and how it's changing the world and then how that's affecting us as humans. I, I could not resist the opportunity to connect Minecraft to that. But also with inside that opportunity, I was aware that BBC Earth used the very famous Sir David Attenborough as the voice to explain this. So one of the key thoughts that I had was, wouldn't it be great if we could lift the power of that man's voice and bring that to young people through the connection of the game? So this is what we ended up coming up with.
And one of the things when we when we built that, um, usually when we build our materials and engage in, in the creation of it, we actually test it for children. We ask children to look at it. And uh, it's uh, it's amazing always the reaction that children have to what happened to the seal at the end of that video. Um, and if you watch the TV program, you actually you can understand uh, what actually happens. But you're dealing with then conversations with children about the cycle of life and how animals live and the pressure on it. And they, they relate back to it. And for us, um, actually linking it to a TV program that brought the materials to life in a real world and getting children to engage with parents on an intergenerational basis. So they could watch the TV program as it started to be broadcast, but then play the game. And so the children would maybe bring Minecraft to the parents and the parents would talk about what they were seeing in the program. We start this whole conversation going around the dinner table or after school, which could progress then directly into school as well for project based learning where children could study could study the animals. We built learning material and the BBC actually supported us with scientists from the BBC Natural History Museum. So everything you see in the game, um, the sounds, for example, are actually the sounds of the animals uh, that the BBC recorded in these places in the world. The actions that the animals do, the scientists help as far as we could get them right in the game, made sure that they were accurate and lifted back. So it's it's the fun of playing the game and understanding the animal through that, but understanding that those actions of the animals are actually what's happening inside the real world. And to just show you some of the gameplay, if you've not seen Minecraft before, I, I've included this short video. Um, and there's a link there at the bottom of this page if you want to search up more about this. So I'm going to give a talk track to this. Um, we actually we start the game. This is actual gameplay. And the music you hear is actually music by Hans Zimmer's company, the um, Oscar winning composer. Hans Zimmer actually wrote the music for Frozen Planet, uh, his team. And his team then also wrote music specifically for the game. So this is unique music to the game that was introduced. And then the one thing that we got was so David Attenborough allowed us to use his voice. And um, the, the amazing, the amazing story is David. So David Attenborough is 96 years old, um, and he just turned up and recorded that in in one go, um, and we were able to introduce that from the BBC in, into the game. But what we wanted to do was, uh, you still have gameplay here, so you see the the polar bear, and this is one of the games that you play, uh, that the children play. But actually, it becomes more difficult as you progress the game. You're trying to lead your polar bears to safety, but the ice is melting. And in the in the regions where polar bears exist, this is exactly what is happening. The ice is dispersing and melting and declining, making it more difficult for the polar bears to navigate their way to safety or navigate their way, way to food sources. Um, and that is representing the game. So what we wanted to do is not be explicit, but be implicit with inside the gameplay so children start to understand, start to ask questions and then start to explore that with their teachers through the teaching materials. We provide uh, teaching materials on all the materials directly on our website. And again, all this content is for free. If you have Minecraft Education Edition or you have the Bedrock version, you can access and download both the teaching content and the lesson plans and the material directly for free. So there are there are um, a range of animals actually built with inside that that are available. There are five worlds which you can play and each of them allows you to build a whole series of projects uh, around understanding the impact on animal life. And then you can watch the real program as well. So that's how we've approached climate change. 
it's been hugely well received um, in terms of kind of the, the broader public. We've seen YouTube posts around the world um, from that particular content, and we've seen uh, millions of downloads of that game already. People are trying to engage with that content and bringing that message home. And it's great to see that game playing with deep impactful learning with inside it is as popular as some of the other DLCs that Minecraft has released uh, in the past. I'm going to move on to the second area now, which is which is computing. And uh, I'm going to touch on a on an area of computing which is really important, which is cybersecurity and cyber safety. And we know that this features uh, deeply within inside European curriculum areas and it, it features within inside uh, computing curriculum areas around the world. And we wanted to um, introduce the concepts, particularly for younger students, um, around cyber safety, uh, the terms and interactions online and purchasing uh, that they're going to come across uh, and how to do that in a Minecraft fun way. And so we, we quite rapidly, actually, uh, at the beginning of this calendar year, built a small piece of work to address uh, that topic. And it was huge. It actually became hugely popular on Xbox. We were expecting it to be popular just with teachers in the classroom, but it became hugely popular with people playing at home and children engaging. And what we're finding is that children are actually turning to some of this source of information to understand themselves, the challenges that they face and the questions that they want answered. So we were delighted uh, when we saw this go out. So this is called Home Sweet Hum. Um, the hum sound is one of the characters in Minecraft uh, called a villager makes that sound quite uh, quite often. And so this is the work we produce for cyber safety. And so um, that idea of stop and think before you click is part of the gameplay, encouraging children to think before they hit that mouse button um, and what's happening actually with inside the computing world and doing that through gameplay has become hugely popular. We've been asked to do more worlds on that and we're going to release more content that extends some of that learning. And coding is still very much part of what we're doing inside computing. And every year we release uh, an hour of code. It usually comes out in the first week in November. I know that's not ready for EU code, code week, um, but we've always aimed for the, the code week uh, with code.org on the 1st of November. But the worlds from each year previously are available. Last year's one, uh, Timecraft, hugely popular. Um, about 75% of people who play this play this with block coding. So we know it's introducing people to coding concepts in a fun way. Each year has a unique theme. Last year, the theme was time travel. Um, and so it all had coding robots throughout time. Uh, this year, we're going to do one which is going to look at uh, escape rooms and computational thinking. So it isn't just about coding, it's actually working through the logic in a computational thinking manner. Um, and that will come out on the 1st of November. But if you haven't seen our code before, this is last year's one.
One of the things we've done with that content is we've made that content available for free. So if you download Minecraft Education Edition, you can actually go into demo mode. And in demo mode, you can do all the errors of code. So even if you don't have licenses for Education Edition, you can get access to that coding content and be able to code that. And we've kept that for the last three years live uh, in, a, in a free context, ready uh, for download in the world. It's translated into 29 languages. Um, so it will support most of the languages on this call for you to access. And there's also support material uh, to support teachers. We're conscious that maybe uh, for some teachers coming to gaming is a new experience and a challenging experience because they've never interfaced with gaming before. So one of the things that we've done is for each hour of code and actually for the Minecraft Education Edition, we put free training material on MS Learn. If you want to access Arrow Code 2021, there's uh, there's a link directly into MS Learn. You can just type MS Learn, Arrow Code, and you can complete uh, in about an hour, hour and a half of learning, you can complete a badge and an online course to understand how to access and how to take your students through that material. The third and final area I was going to talk about was community. And when I joined uh, Minecraft, we'd already done work uh, with a piece called uh, Lessons in Good Trouble, which looked at particularly uh, the stories of, of MLK, uh, we're integrating that, but we also looked at uh, Malala. Um, and what we were trying to do with that is understand uh, the contributions that people made to place and how they built community. That work attracted a conversation between myself and the Nobel Peace Centre in Oslo and the Nobel Peace Prize. And they asked me to um, consider building a piece of work which was about citizenship and building better societies around us. And we actually built a piece of work in March called Active Citizen. And Active Citizen was hugely popular. Uh, I noticed somebody in the chat earlier was saying that they were the competition winner for Active Citizen. Um, and I know that that was, was featured with the colleagues running this call. Um, so it was great that you were participate in that. Some of the stats from that work were tremendous. In one hour, uh, in one day in Norway, 19,000 children played Active Citizen simultaneously. There were more people playing Active Citizen in Norway that day than got married in the entirety of Norway for that year. So it actually has huge impact and reach telling the stories of peace laureates like Malala uh, and, and Fridjof Nansen. So we were telling these amazing stories of people who had built peace and built community. And the Nobel Peace Prize and Peace Center came back to us and said, look, we, we love that work so much. Could you build us uh, some more work to tell the stories of how we mitigate against things like war and disaster, um, but also how do we build peace? How do we actually come out of out of those serious situations into a peaceful uh, society? And how do we stop uh, deep harm? And with their advice, we actually focused on four different people. Uh, Karl von Oyeski, who was from Germany, um, and he was a journalist in the 1930s who was able to write articles um, about the, the breach of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and he was able to really show very early on the power of importance of freedom of speech and freedom of journalism. So we were able to take that story on. Archbishop Desmond Tutu from South Africa, who was key and central into the abolishment of apartheid. And the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Center helped us write uh, his story and his narrative which was really about uh, peaceful protest and peaceful engagement to bring about uh, human rights. Uh, Jody Williams, who is an American uh, anti-mine activist, um, who actually got the, uh, mine, the uh, mine ban treaty uh, in place in 116 countries. And she is, as a Peace Prize winner, still alive and actually helped us build this game and build and tell her story. And then the UNHCR, which is one of the few organizations who won the Peace Prize, to tell the story about how we get refugees to safety and how we bring them into uh, from disaster or war into safer worlds and make that transition. We were able to work with all those parties uh, to build this, this piece of work directly.
and so uh, one of the things I had to build in that, and, and I'll finish on this story, one of the things I had to build in that was the Nobel Peace Centre. And I actually hadn't visited the Nobel Peace Centre because of COVID, we ended up talking on teams like this and building really out this content uh, virtually together. Um, but I got to attend the Nobel Peace Centre as part of the launch. And I was able to walk the city of Oslo and just find the Peace Centre because I'd built so many, we'd worked to build so many buildings and so much of the experience that I just became familiar uh, with all the buildings and the surroundings through Minecraft. And when I arrived, they were, oh, you know, you, you're here on time, did you use, did you use maps to get here? And I was like, no, I, I just understand the architecture. So the architecture actually in Minecraft allows you to bring out. And hopefully that lets you see that we, we tackle tough topics, difficult topics, and we allow conversations between trusted adults and young people. But we do it in a, in a way that has a, a fun, a meaningful, and immersive understanding and brings a richness to life in all the content. So hopefully I've given you a sense of some of the ways we can approach game-based learning, how we can create impact and create positive impact through education using games. Uh, and hopefully maybe I've inspired you to go and look at some of this content yourself. There's my details. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. You can find me in all sorts of places on the internet. Uh, my email address is, is pretty easy and it's been a pleasure talking to you and I'm looking forward to your questions. So thanks very much, I'll hand back. Thank you very much, Justin. And just before going back to a Q&A session, I would just like to remind everyone again to sign the signature list. This is the only way to get a certificate for this webinar. And Justin, it's also interesting to learn that also you who helped build this world, you learned something from it. So uh, it's actually you don't need to use the map and it, ne next time you go to Oslo, you just have to use the information you earned while preparing the Minecraft world and by playing it, I guess. <laughs> and I believe this and, and is I, your favorite. Yeah, but I, I, I whenever I, I have learned so much um, since taking on this job, because everything that we do, you become immersed in. So even learning um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, when we were building that out um, in the world, um, one of the things we have there is a, is a protest, and it's a protest at, at a barrier area with, with police. And when we introduced the sound to the protest, it was the sound of a, you know, a noisy sound of protest and people shouting. And when we worked with the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Centre, they said, no, but at the protest in South Africa he was involved with, there was no shouting. People sang songs. And people sang, and there was a particular way of singing um, and, and singing uh, the words of the protest uh, into that. And they shared that with us, and it was completely different. It was transformative. But to be woken up to um, how peaceful process is being conducted and get that, actually get that audio into the game, change the meaning of the game just from learning. But, you know, it's just one small factor of learning as we build these these wonderful worlds, uh, we're, we're picking it up as well. So, yeah, I've, I've probably learned more in the last year than I've probably learned in five years prior to that. that. That's nice to hear because that also tells our teachers and our students that even when you think that you know a lot about this, you can always learn more. So there is uh, always something uh, for everyone to discover in Minecraft worlds. Um, I can also just say amazing how uh, the the way you collaborate with BBC, also with the composers. It's nice to see that uh, you're collaborating on so many levels with different people, different institutions. I guess that also brings uh, an extra value to the to the final product because it does sound and it does look amazing. So I guess uh, all of that counts in at the end of the day. And um, now let's see the questions from the audience. Uh, so uh, Rachel is asking uh, about the access to the games and she's asking if you need to buy Minecraft Education Edition or uh, and is that the only way to access all of the worlds? Justin, can you tell uh, Rachel what would be your advice? Yeah, so um, if if you want to do coding, the only place to do coding is with Minecraft Education Edition. The The main version of the game doesn't have the coding element in it. But as I said before, what we've done is we've included the uh, hours of code coding in the demo version of the game. So you can actually download today education.minecraft.net. You don't need to log in. You can actually try it for free and you can actually run for 10 times uh, on each each installation. 
the arrow code world. So you can take that to learners tomorrow. To access the other content, you do need a copy of Minecraft Education Edition. Um, a lot of schools and areas actually have it already. Um, they probably don't realize that they have it. And maybe they haven't activated it or been able to use it, particularly if you use Microsoft 365. Uh, products, if you're using like Word and PowerPoint and, and all those kind of things in your school, chances are you have Minecraft Education Edition. And we also provide a version for homeschoolers as well. Um, so on the other side of it, uh, you can access the Frozen Planet game and the Peace Builders game in what's called Bedrock Marketplace. So if anybody has Minecraft uh, Bedrock version, the main version of the game, you can access those two pieces of content for free. Um, so we actually produce all the, the learning content for free. We, we don't charge for it. Um, and that was part of the work that we do with these partners is we want to raise their voice and it's, it's a part of the game given back to the world. And I guess that's also the case with the teaching materials, correct? They're also free for teachers to download and to use. Yes, so education.minecraft.net has all the teaching materials. There's no password, there's no account needed. You can just go and access that. So even if you just want to read about polar bears and access lesson plans on polar bears, you can get that straight away. There's PowerPoint decks we include. So we tell the stories of all the peace builders and you can tell the stories in your classroom and, and use it that way. There's over 800 worlds on there. I've just highlighted some of the big pieces of work that we've been doing recently and, and the content around that. That is a lot of material for teachers to go and explore, but uh, I believe that everybody can find something interesting for themselves here. Uh, we also had a comment uh, actually from uh, Virginia, Virginia who said uh, that she really liked the blogs in one of the one of the videos. And uh, yeah, th that was an amazing video. I believe that was the one with the headmaster uh, talking about uh, how the students in his school uh, work and how they collaborate, how they also learn through the education edition, but they also uh, learn on developing some skills, for example, communication skills, empathy, collaboration and so on. Um, I have a question regarding this. This seems like really interesting for kids, but also do they spend a lot of time, a lot of screen time when, when you take a look at uh, their little hands with the tablets and uh, laptops and um, does it help them despite uh, the screen time what they what they get from the Minecraft edition? Yeah, I think I think this is one of the things that we've tried to build with the game is that first of all, the games have purpose and they always have purposeful learning inside them. Secondly, we've built learning materials that wrap around. So we take children out of the game to learn concepts. So the, the point about the blocks and the Vikings, and if you search uh, Minecraft Education Edition Vikings, you'll be taken to the Vikings web page and you can actually download the templates for those blocks. So uh, we, we include those templates to encourage uh, non gameplay activities that develop the learning and, and develop deeper understanding. And through that, we're trying to encourage responsible play. So children are understanding when to take a break uh, and when to immerse themselves back in the game. Some of the activities that we've built are designed in such a way that they are challenging, that you have to take time out to discuss the challenge and the problem with your, your fellow players um, around that and then re-enter the game to complete it. Uh, and that again is about encouraging conversation uh, outside the game, encouraging that network and play. Um, so the game is used to enhance the experience, not be solely the experience ever on, on the learning content. And conscious that, you know, we, we want the game to do good. It isn't about consuming um, everybody into the game. We want the game to bring something to life and, and to make meaningful content like the, like the polar bears. Uh, suddenly being a polar bear and leading your baby cubs is fun and immersive, but it also makes you hopefully go away and look at the, the, the television program or look and go away and do some research uh, online about polar bears. Thanks a lot for explaining because I think that's also uh, screen time is always the concern of teachers, but also 
all the parents whose kids are getting older and they want to, to have more and more screen time. And um, I just also wanted to ask about the age groups. Uh, you mentioned at one point uh, that average uh, it's 24 year old, uh, but that also it involves different uh, different uh, so uh, categories. So not only children are playing this, but parents, teachers, and so on. So what do you think? What are actually not? No, uh, what are the um, the statistics when it comes to users? Are they mainly coming from early, early age? When, when I say early age, I'm talking about uh, primary and secondary schools, or is it uh, more adults playing Minecraft? You know, it, it, it's across the spectrum. Um, and our content, uh, if you go into the particularly education edition, it has ages attached to it. So we try and target specific age groups. So the, the Peace Builders is very much um, 11 to 16. Uh, we want it in that upper age range, whereas Frozen Planet can be addressed from six um, onwards uh, because we've introduced the audio into it as well. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of narrative, but but has that gameplay. And really, it's kind of from eight onwards. It, it has it has most impact. Um, so we've we've aimed at certain age categories or certain areas of the curriculum uh, with the work that we've produced. But in terms of gameplay, um, we we see all ages participate. So we see young children. We see all the children return to the game, maybe to hack it or code it or mod it. Uh, modify the game and modify the components and get involved in the coding, which is great for developing those computer science skills that industry needs. We see the game used at university level. Um, I've seen examples where it's used as a platform to teach game and coding. Um, I'm doing some lectures uh, in a fortnight's time uh, to university level students about how to design games like this. How do you build uh, you know, polar bears uh, inside Minecraft and how do you approach that gameplay? So they're, they're using it as a platform on which to then build game content. Um, I've seen examples where, uh, I actually saw an example in Israel where the professor of quantum mechanics during COVID couldn't teach some of his quantum mechanics class because his, his students were distributed uh, back at home. So he built an escape room which had quantum mechanics puzzles in it. And the students had to escape from the escape room using quantum mechanics. We actually went further than that. And he started building, the students actually started building their own escape rooms and sending them back to him um, for him to solve quantum mechanics puzzles as well. So it's being used by all ages in imaginative ways. Um, and as I said, being used by, by old people. And this is one of the things we wanted to do with the climate work, whereas connect generations in a conversation. It wasn't just about children playing polar bears or orca whales. It was about having that conversation about what impact are we having on the world around us and letting adults enjoy the game just as much as children. I'm sure they all enjoy it, but when it comes to the skills they need, um, what level, let's say, of IT skills does one have to have to play Minecraft? And uh, in case not all teachers are uh, from IT sectors and uh, from IT subjects, uh, how can they get trained to to be able to offer also this in the classrooms? So I think you can, I think you can approach Minecraft with a basic level of IT skill. You need to be able to download and install and start the app. Um, that that kind of level. And then we provide, if you go to uh, MS Learn, um, if you go to that website and you type in Minecraft Teacher Academy, there's actually three one hour lessons, which tells you everything you need to know about bringing, uh, learning enough of Minecraft to be able to bring it into the classroom. So in three hours, you can go from nothing to hero by bringing this then into your classroom. The content you can actually introduce into the classroom without having to play the games. There's sing a lot of this content is single player game. And with the learning materials there, you can actually explore what is the Nobel Peace Prize? What is the Arctic Ocean? You can explore these concepts and you can hand the game over to children uh, and children will just adapt to the game uh, immediately and really enjoy it, being immersed in that conversation um, that they've just had with their teacher, but in a game in a game sense. So three hours. MS Learn, uh, Minecraft Teacher Academy is where you need to go. Many thanks for, for that. And you, we can also add that uh, in, in um, chat as a link so that our viewers can see. And uh, I have a question for the audience. How many of you think that your children are better in Minecraft than yourselves? 
Let's see your hands. It doesn't have to be your children. It can be just your students. So that we uh, also ask uh, all the teachers present. OK, we see that. Uh, we see the teachers uh, tend to tend to agree with us because uh, it is also interesting how everything is presented as a game. And for that reason, it's also attractive to children. So I guess they also tend to spend a lot of time investing and uh, collaborating together to find better solutions to build the world. But also they do not see that as the strict learning because it comes through the game and this is the whole the whole point of this type of learning and i, I believe it's a really uh, wide variety of uh, of skills are developed uh, by just uh, using the games such as minecraft and also it gives really opportunities because every year i believe you deliver new worlds and these are just amazing. Frozen Planet uh, is going to be my favorite i would say it's really it really looks <laughs> tempting i would say yeah, okay. the, the, the the penguins in Frozen Planet uh, went up on Instagram uh, last week and they had uh, half a million likes, uh, just the penguins. Um, you, you know, you get that kind of attraction and the penguins are, are my favorite. Uh, the penguins come out at the end of the series. So if you want to if you want to be a penguin in Minecraft, you have to wait to the end. But to your point about um, teacher, you know, young people knowing more than teachers, um, it's great to flip the classroom sometimes. And what we find is that uh, with some of these games, the children want to help the teacher. And so they start explaining the game and there's a conversation that happens in the classroom where the teacher is being taught and we flip the classroom, um, you know, just through the nature of gameplay. And children who maybe are quiet or disengaged suddenly spring to life because this is something they're comfortable with and they know about. Uh, and they start learning about the content and it can make the difference between that child struggling and, and disengaging for a number of years and coming to life and really feeling part of it. So. Exactly. And it's nice, as you said, it's nice to have a change sometimes in, in that sense. Uh, OK, so we have answered the questions that you had. Not so many questions today, but we have covered many interesting topics. And just before saying thanks to Justin and to all participants of the webinar, I would like to remind you of other events European Schoolnet and Santix are preparing for you. So you know that the back to school campaign is still ongoing, so stay tuned for upcoming webinars and check out our web page to join the competition that we have. Uh, apart from that, we want to remind you that uh, the Scientix TV, uh, the 20 minutes filled with interviews, discussions, presentations and homemade experience, uh, who, which is also may aimed to educate and entertain, similar like uh, Minecraft, is uh, going to be out soon. And uh, next week you can expect our new episode and you will learn more about the future of education. And the last but not the least, Scientix Conference. Uh, you know that it will be held online this year in November and the registrations are open. Uh, as the places are limited, please hurry up to secure your, your spot. And Justin, thank you very much. It was a pleasure being your host tonight and it was a pleasure learning more about uh, the new worlds that you have uh, that you have uh, discovered and prepared for, for the viewers. And the... Uh, we can really learn a lot through gaming. So thank you. Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye.